Greetings all. This is page 315, and this will review the periodic trends, something that I think you probably remember pretty well from honors chemistry, and it is one of the subjects that is not as difficult as the other subjects that are in this chapter. In any case, let's remember that when we see a trend or a pattern or a regularity, there's a reason for that. Trends, patterns, and regularities do not occur in a random universe that has no rhyme or reason. Trends, patterns, and regularities have an explanation. They reflect, again, the idea that there is a God who does not change but is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so not only do God's moral laws found in special revelation, the Bible, not change, but God's physical laws, which he uses um, as descriptions of the patterns, regularities, and trends in his creation, also do not change. Just like God's moral laws are everywhere true and all time true, so are God's physical laws that describe the patterns, regularities, and trends are everywhere true throughout the universe and always true as long as there is a universe. And of course, the only when we do see changes or modifications of the laws that we are attempting to describe, it's because we've learned something new, not because the universe has somehow fundamentally changed. So, having said that as a background, the key sentence is right here in italics. Similarities and properties of the elements are the result of similar valence shell electron configurations. So, let's remember that the word valence means the outer main energy level. That would be designated by quantum number 1 or 2 or 3 all the way up to the letter N. It does not refer to S, P, D, or F, which are common designations for the subshells. So, the valence shell contains the outermost main energy electrons, and because they're the outermost main energy electrons, they're the ones farthest from the nucleus, so they're the ones that most readily are gained or lost in chemical bonds and in the formation of ions. The word configuration, we have all those different configurations which you need to know for the test. The electronic configuration that begins 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and so forth. Sometimes we use circles, and we use the slashes. Sometimes we use boxes, and then we put the arrows in the boxes. Those are different kinds of configurations. And then eventually we're going to learn to use Lewis dot structures, like sodium, which would have one electron in its outermost main energy level, the third. So what are these periodic trends? Well, you might remember there are six of them. And the first one is atomic size. We see two trends in atomic size. One is you go from top to bottom on the periodic table. One is you go from left to right. And that will be true of all six trends. Also, keep in mind that you should know the reason for the trend when you go from top to bottom of all six. And the reason for the trend as you go from left to right of all six. And if I can summarize it, and it's a bit of an oversimplification, we would say that the trend of all six periodic trends as you go from top to bottom is always because of having one more energy level. And the trends of all six periodic trends as you go from left to right is always a function primarily of having more protons but not increasing the number of energy levels. I call that protonic pull, but in a few minutes we'll see something that is a 
whose language is a little bit more precise. So in this picture right here, you see circles representing atoms, and the size of the atoms proportionally represents the, uh, the trends that we see. And hopefully you'll notice, for example, in this second um, period, in this second row, that we start off with our biggest, and these are in picometers, Picometers are 10 to the minus 12th p.m. You need to remember that. That should be common knowledge now. And it goes from 152 to 113, down to 83, and it keeps getting smaller. And then there's a little bit of a jump here. So there are irregularities in each trend. But the irregularities are not for no reason. The irregularities have a second level of importance, a second level of explanation, that is also true. God's creation is never as simplistic as having one level of complexity, and that's it. There's level after level after level of complexity. And technically, I don't think you should expect anything else from God's creation. So you might say, well, why does this go up a little bit? Well, keep in mind that as you add all six electrons to the outermost main energy level, and this one would be a, um, in the, this is in the second energy level. Here's my S subshell. All of these are in the P subshell. Over here would be the sixth electron in the P subshell, and this would be an inert gas. So putting the inert gases aside, what we have here is a slight expansion in size because the electrons now, remember, all repel each other. And eventually you get enough electrons that the mutual repulsion of the electron causes it to expand ever so slightly. We see the same thing when we come here to period three. And we see the same, um, and it's not as pronounced here, because as you get farther away from the nucleus, the nucleus has um, a little bit less of an influence, and the size of the p orbital and the s orbital in the third energy level is bigger, so there's room for more electrons that are repelling each other. They're not quite as closely packed together where their mutual repulsion would affect each other. So that's important to see. And by the way, when in a few minutes when we get to the periodic trends for atomic radii, you will notice that the trend for atomic radii, um, uh, ionic radii, excuse me, is the same as the trend for atomic radii. They both decrease from left to right, and you'll notice they increase from top to bottom, because each time you go from lithium to sodium to potassium to rubidium to cesium, you're adding another main energy level. You're going from the second to the third to the fourth to the fifth to the sixth. And then francium would be the seventh. And it's like adding layer after layer of it to an onion, assuming you even have ever cut, chopped up an onion before and know about its layers. And there are some other interesting things going on here that I'll um, allow it, let you read. Um, how would you like to have one of these things uh, come through your roof in some random fashion from outer space. But um, we do know a lot about the chemistry of outer space thanks to meteors. Now you might ask this question. How do we even know what these little numbers that are 10 to the minus 12 are? How do we even know that? And by the way, remember, we're using a sphere but this is not a solid surface. This is a region of space within which you'd find the electrons 90% of the time. And in fact, keep in mind, a P subshell isn't even a sphere. But we're using the circles to represent these atoms anyway. So how do we find the radius of something that doesn't have a solid surface? And this is how. We either look at their crystalline structures. Crystalline structures would be what we need 
if we're going to be looking at, say, salts, ionic compounds, or metals, or if we look at Brinkelhoff, diatomic compounds. So when we look at diatomic compounds in their solid state, this would be pure carbon, for example, you can use x-rays and shine the x-rays at these atoms with the assumption that they're as close together as their um, nuclei, will, which are repelling each other, will allow them to get, and their electrons, which would repel each other, would allow them to get. You shine their x-rays at them and look at the diffraction, and you can deduce this distance right here from nucleus to nucleus. And then you just cut that distance in half, divide it by two, and that gives you the radius of carbon or the radius of chlorine and so forth. That's how they do it. So these bullet points then summarize what we see as far as the trends are concerned in atomic radii as you go from left to right and as you go from top to bottom. Now, the next periodic trend is ionization energy. And we need to say some things about this as well. Now, we typically think of an ion as being either positive or negative, which is true. And we're tempted to think that ionization energy would be, therefore, the energy it takes to either take an electron away or to add an electron. Taking an electron away would create a positive ion. Adding an electron would create a negative ion. But ionization energies are used to, for cations. We use the term ionization energy for taking in away an electron to create a positive ion. Later on, we'll talk about electron affinity, which is kind of like the opposite of ionization energy. And electron affinity would be for creating negative ions. So if you look at this equation right here, if we have a neutrally charged atom and we take an electron away, remember we don't say minus a negative electron, instead we put it over here with a plus sign, and as a result we get a positively charged atom, which you, you know is a cation, as a positive ion. So when we look at these trends, First of all, let's talk about going down the periodic table. When you go from cesium to rubidium to potassium, you'll notice that the trend is to get smaller. It takes less energy to take potassium's lone single electron in the outer shell away than it does to take this, this one. And, oh wait, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong chart. Uh, this, is the, this is the chart that's showing atomic radii going down as you go down the periodic table. Um, I said that backwards too. This is increasing as you go up the periodic table from the front to the back. Um, kind of sneaky change there. And then this one goes down with a little bulge at the end because of the fact that you have all these electrons now in that outer shell that are starting to repel each other. So when we look at First, ionization energies. Let's remember we're talking about just to remove the first electron. This time, you're going from the back to the front. And you'll notice that as you go from the first to the second row, to the third row, to the fourth row, it takes less and less energy. And the reason is potassium's outermost electron is much, much farther away from the nucleus than hydrogen's outermost electron, which makes it easier to take this electron away because it's much farther from the positive nucleus. So that's the reason why the trend is to become less as you go down the periodic table. Now, as you go from left to right, there's a general trend to increase in ionization energy. It takes more and more and more energy as you go from bottom to top as you go from bottom to top, in general, as you go from left to right, it takes more and more energy to take that outer shell electron away 
because of the fact that you're getting closer and closer to having an octet, which seems to be an optimal um, number of electrons. And also when we think of the nucleus here, we think of two there and two there, pair up, but you've got to think in three-dimensional space. That seems to be a very, very stable arrangement to have four pairs of electrons in three-dimensional shape, kind of tetrahedral, and um, as a very stable configuration for an atom. Now, you'll notice all these irregularities. We go up, down, up, down, and then we go up. And, of course, the reason for that has to do with the partial filling and then the complete filling of a subshell. So as you add electrons to the um, P subshell, boron, then carbon, then nitrogen, and then, in other words, you're getting more and more stable here because you have one electron in each orbital. And so this is pretty stable, so it takes more energy to take away nitrogen's electron. But then now when you go back to pair them up and you add a second electron to the orbital, the first px orbital, to create oxygen, oxygen would say, you know, if you take that electron back again, I'm back to the stable shape of the stable configuration of nitrogen. So it goes up, drops down, and goes up. You half fill the p subshell, and now you've got to put the other three electrons in each of the three orbitals in the P subshell. And you see that trend also at one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. So our trends again are to increase from left to right takes more and more energy to rip off the electron because you have more and more protons tugging at it and you're, you're approaching an octet and it becomes less and less energy as you go down the periodic table because of the fact you're farther from the nucleus. Now with electron affinity, the opposite in a sense of ionization energy, this is what you learned about in honors chemistry. And this book introduces for the first, this is the first edition that's done this of the many editions of the book. They talk about attachment enthalpy, which I'd never heard of until this edition of the book. And these two are approximately the same thing and probably good enough for not to worry too much about the distinction. I think the idea is attachment enthalpy is maybe a little bit more precise in its language than the more general idea of electron affinity. Remember, affinity means to want or to like. For example, I have an affinity for pizza and root beer or for the flavor of vanilla. Affinity is a liking. And so when we talk about electron affinity, you might remember that the elements on the right side of the periodic table actually would like to get an electron or two or three to gain an octet, but the elements on the left side of the periodic table, the metals, would actually like to lose an electron to fall back to um, an octet. So that tells you a little bit about the trends in those electron affinities. <clears throat> and there's a lot more irregularities with this. But again, if you look at going down the periodic table from column, from row, uh, row one to row two to row three to row four. Again, you're farther from the nucleus, so it's easier to gain or lose an electron from the outer shell. But then as you go from left to right, with big irregularities, you can see that the general trend is to go up. But again, you have to take into configuration that here you have a full S subshell. So calcium, for example, would say, um, if, if you can, it would not put up much of a fight if you try to, um, it, its electron affinity is very, very low 
in the sense that it really doesn't want to have another electron because at least it has two electrons in the S subshell, which is a full subshell. And over here, we finally finish, fill up the entire energy level. And these elements here would say, if you would just give us one more electron, we'll have an inert gas. And an inert gas is very, very stable. So they really have an affinity for one more electron because that's all they need to have an octet. So there are a lot of irregularities there, but the pattern remains. Less energy is necessary as you go down the periodic table because you're farther from the nucleus. <clears throat> More energy is involved as you go from left to right um, because you're getting closer to an octet and you have more and more protons. Now, by the way, these energy values are typically negative. Negative does not mean less than zero. Negative just has to do with being exothermic or endothermic. As you become more stable, there's a release in energy. Just like when a building falls down, it becomes more stable. But in the process of falling down, it releases all of the energy it took to build it in the first place. So typically, your electron attachment or electron affinity um, energies for the elements that want an electron are negative. The ones on the right side of the periodic table, the nonmetals, like to become closer to an octet, and as a result, they'll pay you with this much energy um, in order to gain that electron. <clears throat> All right, the next trend were, was the trend having to do with ions. And now we're only looking at the ions, not the outer shell. Now we're just looking at, prim at primarily at the core electrons plus the nucleus. <clears throat> and you have the same trend that as you go down the periodic table, it gets bigger because you're adding energy levels, just like with the atomic radii. And again, as you go from left to right, it gets smaller. Now notice something right here. There is a big jump, let's change colors here. There's a big jump from going from the S to the P subshell. Notice it goes down. It jumps up when you begin the P subshell and then goes down again. Because you have to remember that when we talk about ions, the positive ions have become positive because they've lost an electron and therefore have lost an energy level. These over here are negative ions and they're gaining electrons. And all these electrons are repelling each other. So they bulge outward and initially become bigger, but then you have your protonic pull, your effective nuclear charge increasing, and therefore the size gets smaller and smaller as you go across the periodic table. And here's some discussion of that over here, as well as a chart um, showing you right here the ionic radius based upon of um, sodium and magnesium, the positive ones, compared to in the same row, uh, the negative ions. These are a lot smaller because you've lost electron. These are bigger. Now, the periodic trends in chemical properties. The chemical properties that any atom has are the result of those valence shell electrons, which is why we spend so much time talking about where are the valence shell electrons, the quantum numbers, how many valence shell electrons are there, and whether you're going to gain or lose valence shell electrons, and how far away from the nucleus, and how many protons there are pulling on those valence shell electrons. So I'm going to close off the chapter right here, and we will pick up later.